is the second year we've done this. We've asked people to come in and talk about what we feel is really interesting in our area. And Ted Greenford has been a big part of this area. And so when I called Joanne, she didn't hesitate. She said, I'll be glad to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I will like take this, turn it over to Joanne. And at the end, what we usually do is open it up for any question. But if you have a story you want to share or something, feel free. Jump right in. OK? Yeah. Great. Go ahead. Thank well, you. Well, the first row is a little intimidating because this gentleman, you all know Fred Stratton, he worked with our as our family for over 50 years. So it's like he has more history than I do. So I, I might be referring to him at any moment. Or he might, if he starts going, mm, then I'll know I'm like embellishing too much or something. But um, so I'm Joanne Mills. And I'm the fourth generation of Ted Green Ford. My daughter's the fifth, and she's there working right now. And um, it's been in the family um, it, since 1913. And um, so I'll give you a little history of how we got the franchise. Because the, the number one question we get is, why are you here? How did you get here? Why do you? Why is there a Ford dealership in the middle of nowhere? And it's a very good question, but um, I'll explain how that all happened. Um, it started with my great grandfather. His name was Pearly Warren Green, and they. Um, his nickname was Perfectly Willing Green, because he would take anything in on trade. And he loved, um, he, he loved trading um, chickens and land and whatever he could, especially for vehicles. So he was an entrepreneur. He had a golf course, a store, an inn. He um, sold tractors and farm supplies. Um, he had a coffee distributorship. He made his own medicine for piles. I have here one of his advertisements. There you go. Very cool. Yes, very interesting. We have some of the containers. Um, he, what else did he do? Oh, he, I'm not supposed to tell this, but my dad's not with us anymore, so I do tell it now. He, he ran a house of ill repute, so <laughs> my great grandfather was a pimp. <laughs> and, <laughs> I mean, he was. <laughs> so, good. so he was a very busy man. And I'm so glad this is being recorded. <laughs> um, so um, in around 1911, the Ford Motor Company was making Model Ts and, and, and actually quite a few different vehicles. Um, and Pearlie wanted to sell these. People wanted them. And he was selling other things, so he wanted this new, new creation. So he was buying vehicles from other distributors in the area and in Vermont in Massachusetts he was bringing all these vehicles here but he wanted to sell his own he wanted his own Ford dealership so he was a very um, sketchy edgy intelligent um, crafty kind of guy and he made a plan up he was going to contact Henry Ford and get him to come to Stockbridge and he was going to get a franchise. So how he did it, he knew that a long time ago there was a philosopher that was born in Stockbridge. And the philosopher's name was Orestes Augustus Brownson. Very intelligent man. He only lived in Stockbridge for two years. <laughs> but he was born there, so it mattered. So Henry, or so my, so Pearlie was like, oh, this is a great guy. He had done, he had done research on Henry Ford and knew that Henry Ford appreciated intelligent people, and of course, Catholicism was always at the top of his mind. Like that was very important to Henry Ford. So my great grandfather, Pearlie Warren, wrote a letter, or it wasn't a letter at that time. He first he sent a. Um, Yes, and asked him to come out um, because we were going to erect a monument in this gentleman's name, and we and he should be here because it's fabulous. So um, Henry said, "Okay, I'll come out." 
So then my great grandfather was like, oh crap, crap, I've got to put a monument up. <laughs> so, so he called the Knights of Columbus and asked them if they wanted to be a part of it. Because of course, Pearlie wasn't going to spend his own money on this. He, you know, like, no way. So he called them and he actually got a hold of a cardinal and um, told them all about this man. And they did research and they contacted him and said, yes, we will put this monument up. And Pearlie said, well, you got to buy the land. I, you got, I need a check for it. He wasn't going to do that. He, he was going to make some money on it as well. So they said, OK. So across from Ted Green Ford, as you go up the back, you know, the parking lot, and there's a driveway, right across is a monument. And it looks like this or this. And um, so the Knights of Columbus came, and they put on this big party. And it just happened to be Pearlie's birthday, 4th of July. And so Pearlie got a birthday party all paid for by the Knights of Columbus. He got a celebration, and he got Henry Ford to come out. And um, Henry brought his buddy, Thomas Edison, and it'll show in this picture, Harvey Firestone, my great-grandfather, and Henry Ford. So they were all there for the big thing. And um, it was quite a stir in Stockbridge at the time because all of Stockbridge was Protestant. <laughs> Who brought these Catholics in here? <laughs> so my, my family got into a, a little bit of trouble over that one, but it worked out fine. So that was July 4th on August 8th, 1913. He got his franchise in the mail. So that's how, that's how PW got his uh, Ford dealership. And really, across the country, um, the, they were in small towns. But not, you know, Stockbridge didn't really grow. So um, that's that. And does anyone know how many Model Ts were actually built? You know. I've, heard, I've read it, and I can't remember what the number is. It's surprising. 15 million. Oh, no. I was going to say six. I know, even yeah. six sounds high, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, and I don't know how many we've sold, but we have all the records of all the cars we've ever sold. And so that's pretty um, crazy. And a lot of people are like, we've got to get rid of these. We've talked about historical stuff. Well, we are historical stuff. So anyway, so Arrestus Augustus Brownson is a patriot, <laughs> philosopher, publicist. He loved God, country, and truth. He was born in Stockbridge, Vermont. This is what this says. Stockbridge, Vermont, September 16th, 1803, and he died in, at Detroit, Michigan. Now, this gentleman, I know this is not, not about Ted Green Ford, but it's very interesting. I know I read it. I couldn't find it to fact check it. Supposedly, this man was so smart that he memorized the Bible by the time he was like 12 years old. Now, I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if a brain really has that capacity to do that. But I think the story just wants you to know how smart this man was. So that's some, he's someone to look up. It's pretty, and they moved to South Royalton, the bigger city of South Royalton. <laughs> so there's that. All right, so what, what's my next? Um, so we built a new building um, in 1916. Pearly built a new building because Ford came out and said, you can't sell cars out of the back of an inn. And um, so he did. And these, there's some pictures up here you can look at afterwards of the building. And it resembles a barn. And the reason it resembles a barn is because he didn't know if cars were going to sell. And he thought, well, I can always put cows in it. And um, you know, that's how they did things back then. Yeah. They were very smart. So, and your husband used to live next door. Yep, and, and he, um, it, my dad um, became the dealer. My, first it was Pearlie, excuse me, then it was Ted, that was who's named after, and then my dad, Jack, and then myself. And um, when they built the building, they also opened up the upstairs for dances and to have movies. And so they showed movies and dancing. You're nodding. Did you go to the dances? And <laughs> 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 it's very reassuring. Thank you. 
Um, so they had dances and um, a lot of activities happened in that building. So it's it's great. Now the building is an, is um, needs a lot of repair, and we have a we have a contractor doing that now. Um, so in 1929, that's when uh, Ted joined um, Ted Greenford. When he passed away, that's where the name Ted Greenford comes from. It was Green's Garage up until 1960, and we had to incorporate. And Ford Motor Company, there was a little blip in our history because we went from to, uh, Green's Farm Machinery to Ted Green Ford and incorporated. And they're like, whoa, you're not a, when it was 100 years old, I had to really prove that we were 100 years old because there was a, a change in the name. And it really threw them for a loop. It threw me for a loop too when I had a 100th anniversary party planned and they weren't sure we were 100. But we got that worked out. Um, so let's see, where are we? We've won the presidency award um, several times, thanks to our staff and, and, and the great people that work for us over the years. And um, and today, actually, little little pat on the back. We just got a uh, a trophy for uh, being fix it right the first time, number one in. In our in our size for uh, Boston region for being you know really good with fixing things so that's a really good thing. Um, in 1946, Ted Greenford um, received the agency for tractors and thank you for bringing this that's cool and um, and implements. In 1970, some of you were around then. You might remember Rodco vans. Does anyone remember Rodco vans? Yep. Um, they were uh, vans that, it, they were cool, it was um, like hippie vans, but high-end hippie vans. And there was a company, you, you remember, <laughs> there was a company in Randolph and in Bethel that actually made them and they would put beds in them and fancy seats and carpeting and shag carpeting and radios and TVs. And um, so that was, um, that was a big deal and it was, it was People around the whole country would buy these Rodco vans. But they weren't just popular here. They were popular other other manufacturers, not manufacturers, but um, van people that were modifying them needed them. Well, Ford only made so many. But somehow, we got all of those Ford vans and got them to Rodco. So the story goes that we don't know how my dad acquired all these. Do you remember this story? Yeah. Oh, my dad acquired these to send to Rodco to modify them. Well, all the other Ford dealerships were bad because they wanted one or two to sell to their customers. But somehow Rod Hughes got this contract with Ford to get them all to go to his company to modify. And they painted them with wild um, paint. And they were really cool. Um, but because everyone else was mad that we were getting all the vehicles, they, they contacted Ford and said, mm -mm -mm -mm, that's not right, it's not fair. So my dad said, you want to go on a road trip? And I said, sure. So it was about 79. We flew to Detroit, went into the Renaissance Center, which was a pretty big deal. It was a massive building. And, um, they frisked us, and my dad went to the top of the building and sat with the big guys, and they said, um, we're no longer allowed to do this because everyone's complaining they're not getting their fair share, and we're going to have to fine you for all the vehicles that you've gotten because we, you've, you know, we, we've let you report them as retail sales, and they really weren't. They were wholesale, so we need this money back. So that was pretty devastating, but my dad, who I don't think he was necessarily eloquent with his speaking, but he was certainly honest and direct, and he talked him into it. He talked him to not charge us for all that money back, and we were really lucky that we got out of that okay. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> so that was, they were, and then that was over. Like, they made the vans for like three or four years, and then there was no more interest. But we have, um, we've been lucky, 
to have excellent people working for us. We've been lucky to have excellent customers. Um, in 2000, or excuse me, 1927, the flood came and wiped out our whole town. All of Gaysville practically was gone. And somehow, Ted Greenford stayed. And I believe, and other people have told me, that if Gaysville hadn't been wiped out, it would be quite a medium, it would be like a medium-sized city now. They had button factories and canneries and snowshoe factory and all sorts of things and, and, and several stories in these factories. So um, it kind of left us a little bit of an island of there's nothing here but us. And there's, we don't have a store. We don't have, we barely have any Wi-Fi. Um, well, we have Wi-Fi, but we don't have cell service. And, um, and Ford can't understand why we're there either. But they let us survive because we have good customer satisfaction. And, um, and we, we sell enough. And so as long as we take care of our customers, they don't mess with us. And I got that verified again this week. <laughs> it makes me nervous. But um, so there's that. Um, and then, of course, in 2011, we had that other flood that we won't talk about, Irene. And it hit Stockbridge really hard again. And we lost like 22 properties, or yeah, in Stockbridge. Um, but the water was pouring off the mountainside. We just opened the windows. We opened the big doors and the water just flowed right through and we didn't have any damage. So we were lucky there too. So we're, we've, we've managed to survive a quite a bit. And we're still there and we hope to be there for many more centuries. So does anyone have any questions? Is that through the same building? Yes. There? And that's one of the requirements um, to be, to say how old you are. You have to have the same building um, or at least in the same spot with the same family. And that's how you can say you're 100 and we're 111 years old. There has a million questions, but I just have a question about the dance hall. Yes. Because um, it just occurred to me, I mean, that must have been perfect with the pea vine. That's right. Up, so yep, yep. That must have been very popular. That's right, it was. Um, yep. Any other questions? Yes. This isn't a question, but I was just going to tell you about that. Yes. Um, back in the time when my husband and his brothers were, because they lived next door to the yeah. garage. Yeah. You know, when every year they take the, the uh, tractors to the Tunbridge Fair. Yes. And the three Ketchum boys were the ones that drove them in the parades. Yes, so they each did. each of them was given a little tractor because for thanking them. For That's the so nice. And the other boys played with them. Got put up well, that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> so it sits on his desk. Isn't that lovely? Well, that's so nice that you brought that to show people. And yeah, Carol was a big part. Like he, he did a lot. He did a lot in our town. Yep. He managed the, um, the fountain all those years. Yep. Yep. He's good. He's a whole family. It's very, and it still is an important family. Yes. Yes, he was. Yep. He's the whole family. Yep. So, yep, Ketchum's are very important in Stockbridge. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm also aware of the, all the Ted Green land that yep. is around, and so I guess that was during the Depression. That so what happened? To, trade land for... Yes, the story, and I have the, all the books, and this sounds bad, and I'm being recorded, but um, Hurley... Everybody wanted cars. Farmers, loggers, everyone wanted cars. So he was very happy to give them to these farmers as long as they were willing to put their farms up for collateral. Well, it only took one bad growing season and he owned the whole farm and all of their land, right down like to the last spoon. And, um, and so he at one point was the second largest landowner in the state of Vermont. Hurley. Hurley. Ted, his son, was a different human being. He was a kind, sweet gentleman, right? 
Now I'm getting teary-eyed. Um, and his job, I think he felt like in life, was to make up for that. And his, what he wanted, I've been told by my dad, was to give it back. Like, so a lot of the property was given to the Forest Service, the, the state, federal government, and he put money in escrow because taxes would be lost when it went to the state or the federal government. And he didn't want the towns to lose their tax base. So he put, they put money into the escrow to cover the tax loss. Um, and the last, th my, when my grandfather was sick, when Ted was sick, he told my dad, sell the land, get rid of it. Because taxes were high and no, the land belonged to the people. He never wanted land to be posted. He didn't believe in it. He, he wanted everyone to be able to use land freely. Which I grew up with that. I went, and this is just a little side story, I went to school in Michigan. Midland, Michigan, which is like, a, and I don't want to think that I'm stupid and naive, but growing up in this family, I'm in school, I'm in college, and it was Christmas, and it was time to get a Christmas tree, and I was with all my roommates, and I'm like, there's a cute one, so we stop, I stopped at the side of the road and cut a tree down and put it in the back of the truck, and my roommates are like, what the heck are you doing, and I'm like, well, it's a tree, and they're like, that's not your tree. And it dawned on me like, oh, 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 this isn't like Vermont where you, where like people were welcome to do what they could. Like it wasn't just open land. And so I learned, I was very naive about that. But anyway, um, so my grandfather wanted that. He didn't want people to own land, tracts of land. And so I, is that how you understood it? I want to make sure I'm, t I'm telling this right. And so now, so that's, that's how it reversed. And I've been told that in, my grandfather had a store on the corner in Stockbridge. And um, when folks couldn't afford food or whatever, because it was a hard time, um, they went to the back of the store and they would fill the cars, their, their, their trailers or whatever, their trucks up. And that's front of the store, you paid the back of the store, you didn't. So I do believe that my, my grandfather kind of made up for my great grandfather. So was, he, was he also doing a little bit of just trading a parcel of land? Like just a parcel of land for a tractor or something? Honestly, like there was not small parcels. It was like full was always, full on farms. Yeah. And families, generations of families owned the farms. And we we literally have these lists of everything that had to come to the to our family from these lists. It was terrifying to see that. Um, and, um, and then it was given back, a lot of it. Um, at one point, the, uh, Ted inherited most of Brandon. And um, yeah, but it was run down, it was not good. And he would take me one of my earliest memories to Brandon when it was rent day, rent collecting day, and he dragged me along because then no one would be mad at him because they're not going to yell at a man with a little girl tagging along. And um, we'd go to every single business, and then the bank was the last one, and we'd pay, put all the rent money in it. But um, it was just too much. And my grandfather wasn't, didn't want that. It wasn't his thing. So that's... That's where that is. So we have some shysters and we have some nice people in my family. <laughs> I'd like to think my dad is a mix of both, or was a mix of both. Probably more Ted than PW. But. I got a story to tell you. Good. Ted, one day this gentleman came into the garage. It's on a Friday, and he worked at Weyerhaeuser. It was a 1958 Edsel when they come out the first year. And he says, I want to buy that car, Ted. She said, okay, no problem. He says, how much my payment's going to be? And he says, roughly $100 a month. He says, oh, I can't afford that. 
Well, Ted says, can you afford $25 a week? Oh, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so every Friday night, he come down and pay $25. <laughs> but he had to program his money monthly. Yeah, monthly. yeah. But he, you know, he might spend $100 and he couldn't make payments, he'd lose his car. Right, <laughs> right. That's the way Ted was, though. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he was yeah. a kind guy. He was. He was a very sweet man. Yeah. I have a story. Yeah. Um, when Fred and I were first trying to buy a house, um, it was a little over budget for us, which was $23,000. And um, John Perliano was the realtor. And so he knew that if we went to the Woodstock Bank, we might be turned down. And he did not tell us that he went to Ted Green. <laughs> and Ted Green, unbeknownst to us for two years, put up the extra money. And Isn't we that never something? knew it. When we signed our house, we, the whole thing. And it wasn't until two you years. You didn't know when you bought it? No. <laughs> they went behind, the realtor and Ted went behind us because they wanted us to get this house. And um, of course, when we found out, we were like, oh my God. <laughs> and we paid him back. And, but he did that because yeah. he wanted to be, he right. wanted us to have this house. Right. And we couldn't afford it. That's right. But he did that. Yeah. He was a good man. Yeah, he was a very good man. P.W., not so much. <laughs> He'd love to come up to you and pat you on the chest. You smoking today, Fred? I said, oh, yeah. You, Ted? No. He said, can I have one? <laughs> he never had a cigarette. No, no, he no, didn't smoke. never had cigarettes ever take him. <laughs> but he'd take one from you. That's great. That is so funny. So, yeah. And, yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. Any other questions? No, I don't want to do my talk after listening to you. Oh I've no! I've done one already in the past, but you did an excellent. Oh, that's sweet of you to say. Very good job. That's so sweet. I I do want to say that um, if a lot of you are readers, obviously you're here at the library, and it it is fascinating to read about um, these gentlemen. Um, that traveled around the vagabonds. I'm sure maybe some of you have heard about the vagabonds. Um, so what ha would happen? It was Henry and Edison and Firestone and a na man named Burroughs who was from New York, and um, they because you know they they all had money. They could do this. They would travel. They would they would take their maids and their cooks, and you know they were glamping actually all over the country and um and we were happy and they actually came to us earlier than they were official vagabonds but one of the descriptions and i found it um this was i thought this was really cute and very um now uh besides friendship and i and this came out of a book uh that they wrote called the vagabonds by jeff gwynn it says, besides friendship, I do believe these men really liked each other and enjoyed spending time together. They also appreciated the publicity that these trips produced for the products their livelihoods were tied to. Burroughs so sold more books, and he was a naturalist. And he loved, um, he loved everything. He, he loved uh, birds and, and plants and, and the environment. Um, and, and he sold books about it back then. Ford sold more cars because they were traveling in cars, uh, which meant Firestone sold more tires, and Edison sold more light bulbs because there were lights on these cars and things that were made by Edison's laboratories. It was kind of the first big social media process, or uh, hashtag, they said, first social media hashtag. And it was also good because it was right after the First War World War, um, around 1918. So um, they were trying to spread good cheer and have fun. I'm sure they had a great time. But um, so yeah, you, when you think about it, that's pretty smart to be advertising that way, all of their products. And they were good buddies as well. But So that's, that is a fun thing. I've read a few books on it. And so if you're looking for a fun read, um, that would be a good one this summer, the Vagabonds. And that. What was the date again? Of that the, was 1913. And the, and the actual date of the date 
19th. July 4th. Resurrection. Yes. So, yes. So there must be an article in the Bethel Courier. Actually, yeah. there were several. Um, let's see. Um, a number gathered here. This was from Stockbridge. And there were several things before this. One bay horse, nine years old, good worker. That was for sale in Pittsfield. Anyway, a number gathered here July 4th to dedicate the memorial tablet in O.A. Brownson's memory. There were several speakers from away, including Reverend D. J. O'Sullivan and Saint, of St. Albans. The Northfield Hand furnished music, Northfield Band furnished music. There was a good crowd present and all enjoyed the nice speaking and music. That was one of them. And then there was this other guy that hated Brownson because of his religion. And then um, here's another. There's a lot. There was a lot of letters to the edit, article editor about it. Some were good. Some were not good. But yes, it was quite the event back then. Yep. Anything else? Nope. Okay. I don't know what time is it. Am I over? Am I under? I don't even know. Eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can talk. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. I want to go to yours. <laughs> <coughs> so yeah, that's that. <laughs>